Okay. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you. Um, thank you for doing this. And the first question, if you'd like to actually is just, uh, would you like to say your name and where you are? My name is Anna Banasi and I'm in Oregon. Okay. And who are you as a human being? That's the big one. That can be qualities about yourself, your passions, your values, whatever you'd like to share. I don't know. I, I think the thing that comes up is I'm a human in, in progress, a human in process, trying to find my way in the world, find my, find my truth, find, um, heal my wounds, um, help others heal theirs, ease suffering, and enjoy life best I can. So in that process, what would you say are some of the qualities of yourself that have uh, developed? Um, qualities. Well, I have a really great imagination. I'm really creative, um, hardworking. And I think I get that from my parents. Um, yeah, I have, I'm adopted. So that's a, I think a big part of my human in process is um, figuring all that. I have a deep history in Mexico, as a matter of fact, and then I have another side of me that's uh, from Mormons and Celtic Scottish folk. And, uh, and then I was raised by Italians. So I have this lovely mix of things that I think informs who I am. It feels that way. And so trying to sort all the pieces of who I am and how I'm influenced is just a lifelong thing for sure. And what would you say is some of the values that you hold as you go through life? Well, um, the value of helping others. I really got that from my mom. Um, trying to speak clearly one's truth to folks that were will listen you know that's and to be a good listener first um i think that came up really early on as well um values oh yeah just trying to be as honest with myself and all my contradictions you know i don't want to come across like <laughs> virtuous when i know that you know i'm complicated I try, but I also fail spectacularly. So I think that is just being honest and gentle and compassionate with the complexity of being human. Um, and I know that from my own work, um, the way I live my life in Gestalt, that being gentle with myself has not always been easy with these contradiction and these con very contradictory parts. So um, I value the process of discovery very much. Um, and respect others' process in that, and don't want to impose my own my own process on top of someone else's. Um, yeah, being a kind person, right? That's a that's an important value. Being compassionate um, and hardworking, and then also the flip side of hardworking is stopping to to enjoy the waterfalls and the birds and the trees and good food and and all that. I think at times I've been caught up with working, 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 and that's, an, I think, an immigrant value. And then forgetting to stop and taste the tomatoes, you know, that kind of thing. I love that as you're talking about this, there's a Buddha just like coming in and out of focus over your shoulder. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that the visual is like, oh, figure of ground. <laughs> figure ground. Oh, seeping through. Mm -hmm. Yes, your Buddha show. <laughs> so what about passions? Would you say you have any specific passions in life? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm a very passionate person. I love to cook and I love to eat. It's a big passion. I love anything involving water, being on water, in water. So I swim and I kayak and I paddleboard. Um, anything involving water, I'm very passionate about. Um, yeah, and cooking, that's kind of a, also a creative outlet. Reading and learning, I'm very curious. So I read a lot all the time. 
Um, so I'm very passionate about that. I'm very passionate about Gestalt and other psychological theories. Um, I feel passionate about space and space travel and Star Trek and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm trying to draw a blank. I'm um, passionate about my friends and family, relationships, good quality, you know, relationships, mm. good quality contact. Again, in that kind of, I'm here holding space for you and I will, and I will listen as your friend and I will do the same, right? Um, so I'm, I'm passionate about that. Like I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Yeah. I read so a lot. Relationships I, often get better with food and, you know. Yeah, food <laughs> and singing. Last night we had a, a friend over and we sang Christmas songs and it's not even Thanksgiving yet. And that was a lot of fun. I love singing. I love music. There it is. Like, I know I'm passionate about stuff. Um, <laughs> what, yeah. what do I do with my life? What do I yeah. Do? What do I do? I hope I'm not just working all the time. Um, yeah. I love to sing. I love music. Um, I, um, like piddle paddle with a lot of different musical instruments, um, ukulele, guitars, I think the thing I'm strongest in is percussion music or percussion instruments, like leading drum circles or holding the main beat in a drum circle. I love doing that. Um, yeah. And nature and birds and passionate about birds. I like watching, drawing, photographing birds. Yeah. And I love anything, you know, astrology and astronomy, that kind of thing. Yeah, sorry about the dogs. <laughs> They're not birds. Um, so what about other people? Who would you say has had a significant influence on you or an impact in your life? Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, my mom and then I think of therapists I've had. Um, my first therapist, had, first, first therapist I ever had had a, a huge impact on my life. I think really saved my life, and really I think planted a seed somehow. I think purposely on me becoming a therapist. I thought, it, thought wow, I really want to have this level of impact on someone's life because it was instrumental, monumental, um, and so. And then I've had marvelous teachers throughout time, English teachers um therapist teachers those have been very and then there's the what i call the more uh fantasy or fantastical people that you read about that you've never met like the the dalai lama and dr maya angelou um, a lot of uh, poets mary oliver is a very huge influence in my life poetry um so it's the like the known and then the, like the unknown but admired <laughs> people so mm. Um, Abraham Maslow, huge impact. When I was 15, I read his dissertation and it changed the course of my life. At the time I thought, oh, I thought I was kind of stuck. I'm like, oh, I can't, you know, learn and I can't like, this is, I'm stuck in my life. And I read about self-actualization and the potential for change. And I was like, Phew. and that really helped me a lot. Um, Viktor Frankl also, all the humanist folks really influenced me really early on and then I kind of followed that path myself. The Buddha, Buddhism, um, you know, I'm not always the greatest Buddhist. I don't meditate every day. I ever think about that when I lose my temper. I'm like, I don't well, think I'm there's happy. competitive Buddhism. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the practice of Buddhism, meditating, it's been a big, big teacher. And I love Buddhism because it reminds me very much, you know, of gestalt of like don't take my word for it try it out and see what you make of it don't follow some dogma dharma that's shoved down your throat like an interject um taste it experience it make your own meaning and sense out of it do you trust this do you not trust this so i that's what got me really hooked into buddhism and gestalt i was raised catholic but my experience of catholicism was pretty awful for the most part Except the Jesus guy, I like the Jesus guy. He seems pretty cool, but <laughs> a lot of things happen from that. So I'm curious about what comes to mind as a specific event in your life or a set of circumstances that you would say have really defined you or shaped you or changed you. Well, 
feel like this is a very worn record. Adoption for sure, being in foster care and being adopted by people who are white. I'm, um, I don't know, 64% Mexican, <laughs> indigenous. Um, so being a dark brown kid in a white family um, is a big deal, I think. Um, that was a big defining. Yes. How old you were when you were adopted? I was I was, I, I was one when I was adopted. So I was put in foster care of the same family. So um, pretty early on, um, that was a pretty big defining moment. Adoption and separation from culture, coming out queer um, and non-binary. Uh, also a big moment. Very big transformational, transitional moments in my life. Um, my family freaked out when I first came out. So. I was out on my own at a young age because of that. And so, um, yeah, those, those moments of um, major change and of course, you know, resiliency coming out of that. But at the time when you're young, you're like, oh, I only have enough money for gas or mac and cheese. How do I, how do I survive kind of thing? Um, but I have, um, and in that of course gained a lot of privilege um, hard earned, but still privileged nonetheless. And so very mindful of that. Well, I do generally ask, and I'm curious now with what you've just said, how you would say you've come to understand and experience yourself in terms of gender. Oh, boy, that's a huge question. <laughs> this might be. Um, mm -hmm. I don't understand. Well, you know, it was this process all along of like not feeling one gender or the other, but being forced to be in one gender, forced to wear. So, I mean, I fought with my mom so much about clothing really early on. I did not want to wear dresses. And I remember when I, you know, she let me, she bought me my first pair of jeans. I was eight years old, I think. And we had just moved and I was just so happy. I was just so stoked. Um, so yeah, there's been these really painful moments around gender um, and about not conforming. So um, yeah, and just finding my way and um, it took me a really long time to really own the non-binary thing. Um, but that's really how I feel. I mean, that's at the end of the day, I just don't, I feel very, you know, androgynous uh, one way or the other. Um, and that's where I feel most comfortable. But because of all the societal pressures, um, that, that journey was really, really long. I mean, I think the, the queer part of being gay was a little bit easier, honestly, to come out with than the non-binary one. And then of course, you know, everyone, you know, doesn't get your pronouns right. And then I, I usually let that slide. And then as the older I get, the more annoyed I get with it. But, you know, um, I just, I just try to roll with it. Yeah. When did you start to find language for the non-binary experience? Yeah. Well, not too long ago, probably close to 20 years ago. Oh. Started. I mean, I felt like before that it was more like, you know, in, in the queer world, it's like butch, femme, and even then, even there, there's a binary, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, sometimes I'm dressed more feminine, sometimes I'm dressed more masculine, sometimes I let my hair. So I was like, I mean, I don't really fit those, those rules or those structures really well. I'm really a mix of all of it. Um, so, um, yeah, so it took some time to just like, like not, I kind of not care. I mean, I think what, what was important for me was it kind of aligned with also too how I wanted to be in the world of work. Um, I had had a lot of different careers um, up to becoming a therapist. I was a nurse and then I went into law enforcement and social work. And so I've had a lot of jobs um, and some of them very much in a, a masculine world where you have to be very like come across this really certain way um, and so finding my way in all of that has been an interesting challenge and i'm grateful for it too because i think it's all formative um, also and you said you know now that i'm sort of at this point in life so what about age how are you experiencing the aging process and the age you're at now it's been it's been a little tough i i'll admit um there's an old poem um by max Ehrman called the desert errata that talks about accepting you know 
the wisdom of, of the years and also kind of the decay. <laughs> um, I'm paraphrasing dramatically, but um, yeah, menopause was really, really rough for me. I, I was surprised because I'd read about it and I, of course, you know, helped a lot of people dealt with that. But then when I went through it, it was very, very challenging. Um, I like to say I kind of lost my, lost my mind a little bit, um, lost my way, honestly. And it was also a confluence of um, my parents had both just passed, the parents that raised me, I had just gotten licensed, and then menopause. So it was this trifecta of things. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I feel like there's a grieving process in for me with aging, and um, I'm really reading a lot of Frances Weller, and the, the, you know, the wild edge of sorrow and the soul wound, and um, really trying to embrace my grief of, of you know, graying and, and losing my hair in the back of my head and all these things that are happening and, you know, entropy and gravity and all that. So I'm, I'm trying to, um, I've been very lucky, I think, because I've had really smooth skin for a long time. But, um, but yeah, just really embrace it and not, and grieve it and grieve the loss of the things I used to be able to do. I was a big time runner. For many years and i really can't run anymore but i keep thinking that i might be able to so i swim instead um but i miss running a lot but my joints just can't i just can't take it anymore so mm. so yeah, yeah so kind of i think a grief process to be honest is like accepting that this is it's part of and it's also buddhism right it's also about letting go it's impermanence and mm -hmm. seeing it on your own body and your mind. But the remarkable differences between understanding that and embodying it, it's like watching night someone day. else go through menopause yeah. versus... That's right. Night, it's night and day. So I feel like I'm on the, I feel like I'm on the backside of, uh, of that, which is helpful that I can now look at it with a little bit of distance and not so much fluctuation of hormones and all these factors. So that's, that's helpful. And what would you say your experience of power and privilege is in your life? My experience of power. Um, well, yeah, at this age, I feel like I have a fair amount of power. I teach, I'm a professor um, at CIS, and I've helped form um, the Bay Area Gestalt Institute. I supervise, I mean, I, I feel like I have a fair amount of power. You know, I'm financially, you know, pretty sound and, um, yeah, I feel that's, I have influence, right? Being a supervisor, being a teacher, it's like, oh, it's so amazing when you, when people are getting, especially when trying to teach Gestalt of all things too. I know we're going to get to Gestalt in the second half, but try to explain Gestalt, which is not the easiest thing sometimes to explain. I think it's better, you know, experiencing it. Of course, it's very experiential, but um, trying to, you know, it's got these clunky words, like, you know, um, levels of neurosis and need formation destruction cycle these really clunky words from the 50s and how to um, enliven that and, and translate it through my experience through my lens so alone right there is power because i'm influencing the way i've digested gestalt the way i've made sense of it and i, I always think of it as an offering like this is my you know way of figuring it out and I'm offering it to you and you can completely discard it. Um, so that has a ton of influence. And I think it happens, I don't know if it happens to all supervisors, but you know, sometimes people, you, you become a projective object and like, oh, you're cool, you know this, but no, I'm human, I put my pants on the same way as everyone else. I have my and fault. I have no idea what I'm actually doing. <laughs> yeah, right, and there's that. Um, but trying to be myself, and not trying to be anything else, but being aware that I do have influence um, and power in that way. And that, yes, I've started from very humble roots. My parents came over with barely nothing, but we worked really hard and now I do have privilege. And so I'm trying to be very mindful of that and try to understand it because sometimes I feel like maybe I'm missing some things in my power and privilege. So I'm constantly chewing on it. And I'm around a lot of strong minded Gestaltists, or we talk about this all the time about, you know, diversity and inclusion and power and privilege and how do we own all the parts of subjugation and privilege in a very clear and humble way, being open um, to the opportunity to talk about 
these very difficult topics. Um, and I don't know everything, you know, even though I'm a person of color and I'm queer and I'm, I, just, I don't know everything. So I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to step into it and hope that we can slow our nervous systems down enough that we can get to repair. Most of the time I can do that with people who are, especially people are willing to do the work. Of course, if people aren't willing to do their work, then they can't, they don't have the capacity sometimes to get to repair. But I try really hard. I stay in the boat a long time, probably too long sometimes. That's, that's encouraging and it's remarkable. It's, uh... it's hard. <laughs> I don't want to paint it. You know, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard not to get activated. I, I until recently, I had a Gestalt group. It's fabulous. Super, it's a consultation slash supervision group. And we talked a lot about difference of everything from anti-vax to, of course, people of different color and backgrounds. And so a lot of stuff around difference came up. Um, and mm -hmm. so it was really great learning for all of us to navigate, to really listen to ourselves in difference and try to understand why someone would make choices that maybe I wouldn't make and vice versa. And not and, and like again stay in that window of tolerance, which is really sometimes can be really difficult. Especially if people are defensive or defended and they come after you personally. It's very difficult for me to stay grounded when someone's attacking me personally. Like, whoa. Yeah, can we I think for most people it is. But... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's it's been a very unusual couple of years, I think, in the the polarization of some of these differences have just been magnified and maybe things that were tolerable on smaller scales are really really being amplified lately i've noticed that in a lot of groups that there seem to be bigger differences yeah a lot of polarization in a lot of in a lot of situations i'm aware of a fluttering of sound i think coming from your side it's like do you hear it yeah. uh, that may be my dog snoring <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Could be the microphone. Just wanted but... to mention it. I'm fine with it. Just like... okay. Uh, well, I can. Uh... Oh, I just yeah. That's weird. Okay, I'll do something about that. Um, but I do. I do want to switch now, and I will just play with my microphone button while I'm asking you this next question, which is after sort of this sort of path in your life, how and when and where did you find Gestalt? Hmm. I found Gestalt in 2008 at CIAS. Um, it's a required course. It's a pre-practicum course we have to take. Um, and I think we're still one of the few universities in the United States that has a clinic connected to it. That's a Gestalt clinic. Um, I might be wrong about that. Um, so I took my first Gestalt class with Lou Gray who had been the director at uh, Church Street Integral Counseling Center for over 30 years. And I just, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it really aligned with my Vipassana training. That's the thing that really connected to me, with me. And that it very much is, you know, come as you are, you know, take self-responsibility, use I statements, all these things, and use awareness to be the agent of, uh, you know, change, choice, acceptance. And that just blew my mind. And so that's, uh, since then, it's just been an ongoing, you know, um, love fest, really, of understanding and studying with her and Geef Patel, Frank Rubenfeld, Margarita Spaniola Lobb, anybody I can just like sit down with and, you know, <laughs> try to mind meld with or uh, read their books, Lynn Jacobs, Irv Polster, all the greats. Um, but in person, one on one, it's been Lou and Give. Um, and then we've had these lovely, you know, visitor, visitor trainers like uh, Bob and Rita Resnick, um, Lynn Stadler, just a lot of different folks and belonging to AGT and EAGT. So, um, but really, it all started with Lou. I really owe a lot to her. Um, just very matter of fact way of teaching, teaching by story, teaching by example, teaching by experientials. You know, we practice with the awareness continuum and all, all the boundary disturbances and all the, the elements, I think. I don't think people teach it the same way in other arenas, but we basically learn the, the classic basic 
tenets of Gestalt therapy. So that was my my exposure to it. And then I um, went through my practicum there and became an associate. And then Lou um, and a bunch of other people and myself formed the Bayer Gestalt Institute and I did the rest of my internship there and led a lot of, um, facilitated a lot there. Um, and then in the same time I was teaching Gestalt, being a teaching assistant and then an adjunct uh, with Lou and Gieve. So that has been my, my internship um, introduction and ongoing learning in Gestalt has been that, that lineage, which I think, if you know, if you try to backtrack it, it's, it's, it's from Fritz when he ended up in Lake Cowich and, and influenced Pat Baumgartner and Pat Gum, or Baumgartner was a mentor for Lou Gray and then Lou Gray brought it down to, to CIS and she would credit Cindy Sheldon as well, you know, the original San Francisco Gestalt Institute, all those folks there really had a huge influence on the clinic. Still, I don't think they know how much, how deep it, it runs. And the director now is Debbie Stone, who's a, been a long time practice, practitioner in Gestalt and Gestalt awareness practice. I know I'm throwing out a lot of names, but she asked me, no, these are all like really important. It's the oral people. history, that's, nobody yeah. knows how things got to be where they are a lot of yeah. times. Yeah, I'm very um, curious about I've been that. trying to sit down and talk to Lou for about a year and a half now. So yeah. you yeah. can never nail her down yeah. <laughs> to another interview in your office. Well, her health is failing. You know, that's that's unfortunate. She's kind of like one of those friends you talked about earlier. And so I've I, I've told her for years she should write. So she's given me little fragments of things, but it's never been an interest. So yes, so her legacy is really in all of us. And mm -hmm. so we try to carry it forward. So what would you say is your gestalt? What is your thing? <laughs> how, how or where or what, what do you do with this? Well, everything. I mean, it, what I like to say, it's the foundation of my therapy practice. It's not the only thing I'm interested in, but it's definitely the solid foundation where everything comes out of from as a psychotherapist. Um, working with clients around awareness so they can make their own choices, um, I think is a huge part of healing. And of course, understanding, you know, contact with self, the other and the environment. That's, it just, in the one ways it always, Gestalt always sounds so basic and simple and it really isn't, <laughs> but it sounds that way. So that's... It's like all of those practices that just constantly remind you to breathe. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Slow that simple. It in. <laughs> yes. And so... Mm -hmm. That's a that's the foundation of um, how I am as a as a therapist, and then you know the big other chunk is how I teach it and try to grok it, and I try to get people to, to do case formulation through a Gestalt lens using like the need formation and destruction cycle, also sometimes called the contact cycle, about the different abilities of people to even contact a need, right? And so um, I think the heart of the things that I'm interested in is awareness and phenomenology. I just love phenomenology. One of my friends jokes, because I've said to them, God, if I could marry phenomenology, I'd marry phenomenology. I love it so much because I think in its purest form, I could be wrong about this, but the way I hold it is that if you're looking at a phenomena um, in its purest form, there's no judgment, criticism, or punishment. Sure, critic could arise, but just looking at the phenomena purely as itself, I think that um, it leaves a lot of that to the side. Oh, it's just this thing that's happening. What It's just what's going on and how I'm making sense of it. And then, oh, I'm projecting or I'm doing this, but try not to put that extra layer of suffering. Oh, I'm bad because I'm projecting. No, not necessarily. You're just projecting, which is 90% of what we do. So until it becomes a boundary disturbance. So, that's to me uh, it just makes sense um to look at the world through this non as non-critical and as compassionate as possible so i think when i am teaching and thinking of, i'm trying to get clients to think about what's happening it's through this phenomena lens phenomenology lens my inner geek is getting all excited about that i'm just like <laughs> so i'm like is it about emptying the self no it's not emptying the self no. it's being fully present and taking in as much of the other as you can tolerate and process it's kind of amazing yeah taking the other and knowing where your boundary is it's like oh mm -hmm. nope 
I'm having good contact with you and now I need to withdraw to regulate my psyche. That's a, a fabulous way for us to regulate. And that also mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me from organismic self-regulation. So yeah, so phenomenology, I think is the thing that comes up a lot in when I'm doing supervision, of course, the classic stuff too around parts work, um, what is getting in the way in the sense of boundary disturbance, the paradox theory of change, which is such an elegant and beautiful part of the theory, right? About really looking at yourself in a way, again, that is not being um, directed or forced. It's like you're trying to figure it out. You know, when people say, oh, I'm too old to change. I'm like, yeah, I guess you are. That's how you hold it, right? Um, but I've seen people change up to the moment of their death, and that's been amazing to witness. So it gives me like we have a lot of potential as Abraham Maslow wisely pointed out a lot of potential for growth and change are we gonna wipe our personality no are we gonna fix every bit of trauma no but we do have the potential I really believe for a lot of movement a lot of easing of suffering mm -hmm. so how would you say gestalt in your encounter with all of the people in it um, how has it affected you as a person? <laughs> how has it affected me? Well, it's, I think it's, it has supported my own uh, process, for sure, my own journey of a human in, in progress. Um, it's given me a structure, a schema, to help me navigate. It's like uh, the internal workings of a compass. I've never thought of it this way before, but it's like the internal workings of a compass. It's helped me find north when I've been lost very dark in the woods where I don't even recognize, my, recognize myself. I slow down and I check in and what am I aware of? Internal, external mind. And that usually helps me get some sense of bearing. Oh, I'm revved up right now. I don't even notice it. Oh, I'm like pissed off and I'm like stuffing it down, right? But it's a beautiful day outside. What the hell? <laughs> you know? So for me, it's all of what I've learned and um, from all these great people has really helped me personally find my ground again when I get lost or I get too critical or I fail, right? I can come back again and again to, to the practices of Gestalt um, and it really helps me. And would you say that there are particular communities or groups that you tend to work with or that you really enjoy or the projects that you're involved with? Well, um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think that's evolved over time. When I came out of um, internship there, we had a little small Gestalt group of, um, and I'm blanking on their name, but of interns that worked and we ran in a Gestalt fashion. Um, I, I would be neglect to not mention the Bay Area Gestalt Institute. That was huge in my life of, of a support structure, being an intern, waiting to get licensed. Um, and it was tough because we were forming an organization and that was really, you know, try to do that collectively, non-hierarchical, with non-hierarchical. It's very difficult to make a decision sometimes, um, but is. we're able to do it. And, and that had a lot of influence um, as well. And really right now, currently has been um, two things really is, is, well, I think it's just one now, but supervising in, a, in the Gestalt clinic. So now the clinic I went through, I supervise a group soup and that's just been a blast. And I, and I enjoy just it. say group soup. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I usually do Gestalt in Spanish. I had never heard that one before. Group supervision, the abbreviation of supervision to soup. <laughs> Sup. It should be, I guess, sup, but group soup. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, so, I just, I really like that one. <laughs> I have a friend who just likes to, to, to cut everything. So have a good sesh. I'm like, never heard anyone say session, sesh. Um, so yeah, group supervision has just been fun because it's going over all these things that I really love around Gestalt and teaching people how to do parts work and my spin on parts work and you know, about it not being a performative thing or not acting, like going through all those things with people who are excited, but they can't quite make sense of some of the tools. And then also trying to create openness because that's the thing I love very much about Gestalt. It's supposed to be creative. 
right? Frank Rubenfeld was always saying it, you know, it's not, you're not being Fritz Perls. It's not like you're going to be a Gestaltist, you're going to be an Anaist, which he was right about, because I bring in attachment theory and neurobiology and all the other stuff I, you know, geek out on in who I am as a therapist. So it's also influences who I am as a teacher. So those are the, I think, the most current, current groups. Um, when before the pandemic, I was trying to get over to Italy as much as I could to um, hang out with the Gestalt community in Sicily um, that Margarita runs. And that was just lovely to be around an international flavor of folks who are digesting Gestalt in all these different ways. Um, I just love that. Um, and I hope to do that again. I have to go to Ireland for AEGT in May if I can get a ticket and fly over. Um, but yeah, just try to learn from from others and teach. And so the group I think that has been most helpful is the two supervision groups. The one I, I just recently ended, I felt I always told them, it's like, I should be paying you all instead of you paying me because I got so much out of it personally. We supported each other. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's also one of my favorite parts of doing this kind of work is the, the supervision stuff. So you've kind of answered this, but I'm, I'm curious what your actual answer is, is whether you feel like you're part of a gestalt community and what that means to you if you do. I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, CIS had its own, it's like, the, like again, like we started in the beginning, kind of the kernel and I and I'm kind of in the middle of it and now I'm out more on the peripheral and come in because it's because it's a community, there's so many people doing therapy and it's like there's could very easily be dual relationship and I try to be careful with that. Um, and so I feel like that's the community, a community of friends who are pretty hardcore gestaltists. Um, and so it's this kind of I feel like inner to outer like it's more dispersed than it used to be but i still feel like i'm in the community with with some of the elders and then some of the folks who are just learning and then kind of then i feel like i'm like helping mentor the next generation of people from our lineage anyway um Gabe and i are trying to we've been trying to write a book <laughs> for a while on this lineage that's over 30 years old that we've taught at the school at cis through lou and um so I feel part of that community. I just feel more boundaried, I think, than I used to um, because of all the different relationships I've had um, and being in all the, like kind of going back to your power and privilege question. I have a lot of power and I don't, I want to be careful um, and also want to be careful of my own personal life um, with the boundaries. So I'm, I feel a part of the community, but sometimes on the outer edge, which is okay. Just with the pandemic. I think I, I feel more disconnected because of the mm -hmm. pandemic and doing everything through Zoom is not my favorite. Like a lot of other people, right? <laughs> yeah, you can definitely say there's pros and cons. One of them is not being with people which can fall into either category. Depending Absolutely. On sometimes it's fabulous and yeah. sometimes, oh, I miss the real certain flavor of quality of contact that being in person almost don't I almost don't have words for it so it has its good and it's bad but yeah I do feel like I I feel like I'm part of the San Francisco Bay Area Gestalt community I think I, I think it's fair to say that so the the collective collaborative process of starting this institute um, sounds like it might be one but I'm curious what you would say some of the more challenging things that you faced in your processes have been in your training or in your practice or in what are some of the challenges that you've run up against? Power and privilege in the opposite direction. I mean, having elders who are white and male um, interfere with uh, me or other people of color trying to take their seat in facilitating a piece of work or whatever it is um, has been challenging at times. Um, Again, I think that finding my my own voice of how I understand the material um, has been challenging. I think that the hardest challenge I had was in the forming of the Bayer Gestalt Institute because it was like we didn't know what the hell we were doing at all, and it was 
just to make it, you know, what's our mission, our vision. It was just this long, arduous process that we got there, but boy, it was a process. Um, and then leaving, I, I've, I'm on the board still, but I've kind of stepped back from my kind of, I have stepped back from day to day, you know, membership so that other people can take the, take the helm and do the work. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably been the most mm -hmm. challenging, um, and would you say that there's some kind of like gap in the knowledge or the training or the support that could actually make that organizing a thing process easier? Because I've, I've seen it a lot with individual therapists who sort of don't get trained in like the business skills, but that whole organizational structural level. I'm gonna turn the light on. It's getting kind of dark. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, we had to do a piecemeal with someone who knew accounting, someone who knew website. Um, I think the thing that worries me sometimes is um, the passing on of the lineage, and but yet also letting people make what they can of it, you know? Um, so how much do you keep from structures that have supported you as in, you know, as a trainee, and then what do you want to make as your own as an intern in a group with a group of people, right? So I get sometimes nervous about that, but I try to have faith like, oh, they'll figure it out. They'll find their way and they can always ask if they're wondering. But yeah, I do think you're right. I mean, again, starting from, from completely scratch was difficult, um, but it took a lot of people having enough motivation, which at the time there was to do all the pieces, the 5013C and the website and who's going to answer the phone and all that kind of stuff. Where do we even live? Do we have an address? You know, that kind of thing. The organizational existential crisis. Who are we? What are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> Why are we here? Who am I in this group? I mean, we, you know, like any organization go through cycles of interns and that's always the first thing they say, like, I'm coming into an existing structure. I don't know where I fit. Mm -hmm. when, and what are you guys arguing about? And what's going on? And how are you like, and how do we vote? for like when we approve something and do we have to approve pencils or can we can we you know vote on giving somebody executive functioning so we don't have to run every little freaking thing by the mm -hmm. large group of 25 people or more <laughs> you know so those struggles i see re repeated and i kind of want to say god i wish i can spare you this but it's i'm it's that current group's process right they get mm -hmm. to decide in the here and now right yeah that's interesting i've, I've heard some of the sort of younger up and coming trainees, it, it, they have a different sense of walking into something that's already been there for a while. It's like, you're coming into a house, you know, that there are grandparents, there's a lineage. Yeah. And it's different. It's very different than the creative freedom because there is sort of that, it's like the weight of having an actual heritage. Right. And without being non-hierarchical, really quite mm -hmm. an interesting polarity. So it's like, we want to give you structure, and, and but also we don't want to tell you what to do. So yeah. it's like being a grandparent, like I got all this wisdom, but you have to ask me, I can't just tell you so that, um, you know, you're living your life, right? mm -hmm. you're an adult to a, 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 you know, parent to an adult, right? You don't tell them, hey, you should do this and that. And you're like, I'm here if you need me, but it's your life at this point, but I'm still here if you need me. Same. It's the same. It's a, it's a nice way of putting it, thinking of it that way for the, for that organization, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm also a big fan of storytelling. So I don't know if, as you've been thinking of these people and these processes, any particular moments have come to mind, something that you might want to share, like a, a phrase or an experience that has an encounter that has stayed with you. Well, I love, I, tell, I love to tell this story. It's a loose story and she knows that I tell it. And I, I have her permission because I tell it all the time. So <laughs> Wonderful. I, I love this and it's a great story. So, man, we're talking probably 2009. Yeah. I walked into the our clinic there in San Francisco on Church Street uh, where Lou was still the director and she was up in the kitchen and always which is very common for Lou she had a cup of coffee in her hand and she was sitting and she was smiling and she was in she was just starting the story when I walked in the kitchen and she said oh god I feel kind of emotional stop talking about this um she said you know when I die 
and I get up to the pearly gates and I see Peter and he lets me in. I'm going to walk in and I'm going to start to recognize certain people. I'm going to go, oh, you were a client of mine. And oh, you were a client of mine. And then she's going to see all of the clients that she's ever been with. And they're going to be smiling and she's going to say, what are you all doing here? And they're going to say, oh, Lou, you thought you were doing psychotherapy for us, but all along we were doing therapy for you. And I love that story because it's like not <laughs> like it's the it's like we're impacted no matter what as therapists, right? We're help we think we're helping, right? And we are sure. And we are impacted and we are also helped. And I just love that story because it feels very um, powerless. It doesn't feel like, you know, so it's a very sweet story. I always like to tell the up and coming students who are studying psychotherapy. Remember, you're being influenced as well by these people that you are trying to facilitate a process with. They impact you. They remind you of so much. They help you through their stories and experience. So I love that particular story. I'm smiling, thinking of Lou. I met her in uh, California in 2014. So shared process group. So I have I have a person to put that story yeah. to. You could story. I think there was a coffee cup there too. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. She loves yeah. loves her coffee. Hmm. Oh. So what would you say is next for you? Where are you going with this? Personally, professionally? Well, personally, I'm, st I'm still in process. I'm still working, working my issues, my parts, my darkness, sadness, grief, joy, potential, all those things are all constantly are in process with my own therapy. Um, and then teaching and then writing, I think, is the next stage for me, trying to write some of this stuff down that I've been hearing and listening to for all these years and making and for, of course putting my own my own thoughts and spin on it um, and so Gib and I have these wonderful sessions which we've all we video record and I'm like okay how do we get it from these video recordings actually to the page and then what does it look like and how does it you know become interactive um, in the here and now that's I mean Gib has all these wonderful ideas and then it's like I don't know how we can actually put all that in the book and make it be you know, this hologram of interactiveness in the here and now. I don't know if we have the technology to do that. So I think that's the next stage is trying to to write down um, some of these thoughts and ideas and work on the parts of myself that I have maybe neglected, which is more of my creative side. So that's kind of been my focus in the, the pandemic um, and also try to get, you know, back in pre pandemic health my health has been a little bit of a challenge so those kinds of things i think is what's next for me and always just you know chewing and understanding gestalt more and more and how to translate it into um a model that works for for people as up-and-coming clinicians or for clients in particular and what are you appreciating about this up-and-coming stuff i mean sometimes i phrase it as you know where do you think gestalt is going but as you're talking about, you know, letting the people who are coming in figure these things out for themselves and take it in their own direction, I'm wondering what you're seeing. Well, I'm seeing the court. Well, I'm seeing what I've seen forever, right? It's like Dick Schwartz is a good example, right? Or Sue Johnson, where they've had a Gestalt course or class, and then they take a piece of it, which I kind of think maybe was the whole idea in the beginning, I don't know, I wasn't there with Fritz and Laura Pearls, but like you make of it what you want, right? So I feel like a lot of people credit Gestalt a lot in like their formation of whatever theory that they then make, like IFS for Dick, right? He's like, oh, parts work, but hey, maybe it's a family. Maybe I should give it names that are more permanent, like firefighter and manager. So he made his own thing, which is amazing. He's an amazing clinician. Same with Sue, Sue Johnson taking, you know, the present moment here and now awareness and slowing it down and taking self-responsibility. She incorporated that with, um, I think his name is Lee Green, in the EFT model. Uh, same with Hakomi. I mean, when I read the beginning of a, I can't remember who wrote this Hakomi book, like Credit Gestalt. So it seems to be 
the seed or creative seed for so many people to do their own thing. It's like a launching point. And so I, that's what I still see. And I think that's right, right? It's like you do what works from this, take the essence, don't distort the history for, you know, but make of it of from what is happening in the here and now through your own experience. How, how could it be anything else? So that's what I, I mean. I feel like as a theory, it feels more popular in Europe than it does here. That feels like it's been like that forever. But then we have these little pockets of areas where Gestalt is doing well, like um, in Gatla for in Bob and you know Rita, even though they're getting up there as well, their groups are really, really strong. Their, their foundation seems very strong. I think the Cleveland Institute is still really, so these little pockets, um, I think are strong. We, I think, as far as I know, we're going to still be teaching Gestalt here at CIS for a while. We're very, we have our humanistic view of the integral, the whole, the perna, the holistic health of a person. So that's it's exciting in a way because it's like, wow, what is, where is that, you know, next therapist going to take this, and how are they going to honor it, of course, and also expand it into more healing, more acceptance. Um, less suffering. I, I like that part about expanding it. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'm wondering if there's anything else you would like to add at this point. Do you feel like there's anything that I've missed that you wanted to bring in? Well, I think, I don't know, I, I've not listened, I've listened to bits and pieces of other people talk about Gestalt, but just that reminder that it is based in science, you know, <laughs> some people have people like, oh, it's just a woo-woo. Props to science, you know? hey, science, if you're listening. <laughs> Gestalt, Gestalt psychology, field theory, come on, you know, like, um, that it isn't just woo-woo, you know, it has a lot of woo, for sure, but it also has some really sound, again, grounded things in science and phenomenology and all these things there there's some real solidness to the theory that i feel sometimes in the history telling of it gets mm -hmm. washed away what gets focused on is the esalen period of fritz kind of going crazy and you know it more becomes more about his personality than the theory and that mm -hmm. part i get a little like no no that was just fritz that's one part of the story yeah we all sure. have messy bits you know yeah okay. that's our shadow right um, and we're, we do have science, <laughs> so props for science. Um, so I guess that's something that's important to me that there is, um, you know, field theory and all of that. Um, well, I, I have heard a lot of people emphasizing the things that you mentioned, which are the neurobiology and the attachment theory and the way that neurobiology of attachment is very similar to all of the relational qualities and things that have always been of interest in Gestalt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great. Right. There's there's a lot of science in there. There is, and it and one yeah. thing that I think that why I think Gestalt is still around is it is that these things are proving that the existentialists weren't wrong in some of their beliefs. They're like being proven. It's not like the thought experiments of Einstein are now being a lot of it's being proven through mm -hmm. hardcore science. And I can say that I think that. The majority of stuff in Gestalt, and there's a lot, of course, can be validated through science. And that, to me, that's where I think where it's going is also very exciting. Is the, you know, our, our research into the brain and awareness and meditation, and slowing down, right? I think that's one thing about Gestalt that's so important. Um, you can't be aware if you're on your phone driving and trying to get somewhere, right? And eating at this, I mean, you're, it's very difficult, right? So our, our Western world of going so fast, um, I feel like Gestalt forces you to slow down if you're really in contact with yourself and the three zones of awareness. Um, and you just can't go wrong with that. That's perennial as the grass, you know, it just mm -hmm. is a solid thing that I think will help no matter where we're going because it just feels like the short time I've been here, like we've just sped up and we keep speeding up. And then so, you know, as Margarita talks about what is the postmodern issues of clients is anxiety because we're going so damn fast and not taking in primary satisfaction of the trees and the water and the birds. So that's where I, I feel like don't give up on Gestalt. I think it's 
will support people into the future as well. It'll look different because things, of course, change, but and don't forget the science. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Well, if that's a good place for you, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Like I said, it had been a while since I did this, and I'm like, I really like doing this. <laughs> I want to do more of these. Good. So I've yeah, been, been a very yeah, appreciative and, that you're interested to. Yeah, no, Talk and, and the going faster is true. I mean, I tell my kids, I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, going to Norway today. And I say it jokingly because it's like the, the sort of the pilgrimage and the effort to go and meet people is condensed into like making the emails connect and then turning on a Zoom link. But there's there's a lot of force and a lot of movement in this part of deciding to connect to human beings. And I really enjoy doing it. I, I really, I feel very enlivened speaking to you today. So thank you. I've enjoyed it as well. Thanks for having me on. Okay. So should we leave it here for now? Yeah. Okay.